Hi, everybody. Um, I'm going to start a new book this week. It's called Wish, Love It. Um, it's by a woman, Barbara O'Connor. And one of the great ways to tell if you like a book is on the back, on paperbacks, it gives you a summary of the story. And sometimes on um, hardcovered books, it'll give you a summary inside. So I'll read you the summer. It says, Charlie Reese has been making the same secret wish every day since fourth grade. But when she is sent to live with family, she barely knows. It seems unlikely that her wish will ever come true. That is, until she meets Wishbone, a skinny stray dog who captures her heart, and Howard, a neighbor boy who proves surprising in lots of ways. Suddenly, Charlie is in serious danger of discovering that what she thought she wanted may not be at all what she needs. All right, so let's find out. Wish. Chapter One. I look down at the paper on my desk, the getting to know you paper. At the top, Mrs. Willoughby had written Charlemagne Reese. I put a big X over Charlemagne and wrote Charlie. My name is Charlie. Charlemagne is a dumb name for a girl and I have told my mama that about a gazillion times. I looked around me at all the hillbilly kids doing math in their workbooks. My br best friend, Alvinia, had told me that they would be hillbilly kids. You will hate it in Colby, she said. They're just red dirt roads and hillbilly kids. She had flipped her silky hair over her shoulder and added, I bet they eat squirrels. I glanced at the lunch boxes under the desks around me and wondered if there were any squirrel sandwiches in them. I looked back down at the paper in front of me. I was supposed to fill in all this stuff so my teacher could get to know me. On the line beside, describe your family, I wrote, bad. What is your favorite subject in school? None. List three of your favorite activities, soccer, ballet, and fighting. Two of those favorite activities were lie, but one of them was the truth. I am fond of fighting. My sister Jackie inherited dad, daddy's inky black hair, and I inherited his fiery red temper. If I had a nickel for every time I heard... The apple don't fall far from the tree. I'd be rich. Daddy fights so much that everybody calls him scrappy. In fact, at this very minute, while I'm stuck here in Colby, North Carolina, surrounded by hillbilly kids, old Scrappy is back in Raleigh in the, in the county jail, again because of his fondness for fighting. And I don't need a crystal ball to know that at this very moment in our house in Raleigh, smack dab in the middle of the day, Mama is in bed with the curtains drawn and empty soda cans on the nightstand. She will stay in that bed the whole live long day. If I were there, she wouldn't care one bit if I went to school or stayed on the couch watching TV and eating cookies for lunch. But that's just the tip of the iceberg, that social service lady said when she rattled off a list of reasons why I was getting shipped off to this sorry excuse for a town to live with two people I didn't even know. It's better to stay with kin, she told me. Gus and Bertha were kin. What kind of kin, I asked. She explained Bertha is Mama's sister and Gus is her husband. She said they didn't have any kids and they were happy to take me in. Then how come Jackie gets to stay and with Carol Lee? I asked about a million times. Carol Lee is Jackie's best friend. She lives in a fancy brick house with a swimming pool. Her mama gets out of bed every morning and her daddy is not called Scrappy. So that old lady told me again how Jackie was practically a grown-up and would be graduating for high school in a couple of months. When I pointed out that I was in fifth grade and not exactly a baby, she sighed and smiled a fake smile and said, Charlie, you have to live with Gus and Bertha for a while. I never laid eyes on those people and now I was supposed to live with them? When I asked how long I had to be there, she said until things settled down and Mama got her feet on the ground. Well, how hard is it to put your dang feet on the ground? Is that is what I thought about that. You need a stable family environment, she told me. I knew what she really meant was, you need a family that's not all broken like yours is. Still, I whined and argued and whined and argued, but here I am in Colby, North Carolina, staring down at this getting-to-know-you paper. 
Have you finished, Charlemagne? Mrs. Willoughby was suddenly beside me. My name is Charlie, I said, and a greasy-haired boy in the front of the class let out a sputtering laugh. I sent out one of my famous glares his way till he hushed up and turned red. I handed Mrs. Willoughby that paper and watched her eyes dart back and forth as she read it. Her neck got splotchy red and the corners of her mouth twitched. She didn't even look at me before she marched back to the front of the room and dropped that paper on her desk like it was a hot potato. I slumped down in my seat and wiped my sweaty palms on my shorts. It was only April, but it was already hot as blazes. You want me to help you with that? The boy in, the fr in front of me pointed to the math worksheet on my desk. He had red hair and wore ugly black glasses. No, I said. He shrugged, took a pencil out of his desk, and headed to the pencil sharpener. Up, down, up, down, up, down. That's how we walked. One leg was shorter than the other, and he dragged one foot along the floor so his sneaker made squeaking noises. I glanced at the clock. Dang it, I missed it. Eleven, eleven. I have a list of all the ways there are to make a wish. Like seeing a white horse or blowing it blowing a dandelion. Looking at a clock at exactly 11.11 11 on my, is on my list. I learned that from some old man who owned the bait and tackle shop by the lake where Scrappy and I used to go fishing. Now that I'd missed 11.11, 11, I was going to have to find another way to get my wish in for the day. I hadn't missed one single day of making my wish since the end of fourth grade, so I sure didn't want to miss one now. Then Miss Willoughby nodded toward that red-headed boy sharpening his pencil and said, Howard, why don't you be Charlie's backpack buddy for a while? Mrs. Willoughby explained that when a new kid comes to school, their backpack buddy shows them around and tells them the rules till they get settled. Howard grinned and said, yes, ma'am. And that was that. I had a backpack buddy, whether I wanted one or not. The rest of the afternoon creeped along so slow, I couldn't hardly stand it. I stared out the window while kids took turns bragging about their social studies project. A misty rain began, had begun to fall, and dark gray clouds hovered over the tops of the mountains in the distance. When the bell finally rang, I hightailed it out of there and headed for the bus. I hurried up the aisle and dropped into the last row. I kept my eyes on a piece of dried up chewing gum stuck to the seat in front of me while I sent laser thoughts zipping and zapping around the bus. Do not sit next to me. Do not sit next to me. Do not sit next to me. If I had to be stuck on a bus full of kids I didn't even know, I wanted to at least sit by myself. My laser thoughts seemed to be working, so I took my eyes off the gum and glanced out the window. That red-headed boy with the up-down walk was hurrying toward the bus, his backpack bouncing against him with every step. When he got on the bus, I quickly looked back at the gum and sent my laser thoughts out again. But that boy didn't waste a minute, shuffling up the aisle and plopping himself right down next to me. Then he thrust his hand out at me and said, Hey, I'm Howard Odom. He pushed at his ugly black glasses and added, Your backpack, buddy. Now, what kind of kids shake hands like that? No kids I ever knew. He kept his hand there and stared me down till I couldn't help myself. I shook hands with him. Charlie Reese, I said. Where are you from? Raleigh. He sure was nosy, but I figured if I laid out the cold, hard truth, that would shut him up, and maybe he wouldn't be my backpack buddy anymore. My daddy's in jail and my mama won't get out of bed, I said. Well, that boy didn't even blink an eye. What's he in for? Fighting. Why? What do you mean? What do you mean? He wiped at his fogged up glasses with the bottom of his t-shirt. His face was flushed pink in the damp heat of the bus. Why was he fighting? He asked. I shrugged. There was no telling why Scrappy was fighting. Besides, there were pl probably a bunch of reasons he was in jail, but nobody ever tells me anything. Gus and Bertha told my mama you were coming. They go to my church and I gave them a cat one time, Howard said, a scrawny gray cat that was living up under my porch. Then he went on and on about how Gus taught him how to make a slingshot and how sometimes Bertha sells bread and butter pickles on the side of the road in the summer. How his mama drove her car right into the ditch beside Gus and Bertha's driveway one time and Gus pulled it out with a tractor and then they all ate barbecue sandwiches in the front yard. You'll like living with him, he said. 
I'm not living with them, I told him. I'm going back to Raleigh. Oh, he looked down at his freckly hands in his lap. When? When my mama gets her feet on the ground. How long does that take? I shrugged. Not long. But the knot in my stomach told me that that was a lie. The worry clutching at my heart told me my mama might never get her feet on the ground. As the bus pulled out of the parking lot and headed toward town, Howard rattled off a list of school bus rules. No saving seats, no gum, no writing on the back of the seats, no cussing. A whole mess of rules that I was pretty sure nobody paid any mind to, except maybe Howard. I looked out the window at the sorry sights of Colby, a gas station, a trailer park, a laundromat. Wasn't much of a town, if you asked me. No malls or movie theaters, not even a Chinese restaurant. Before long, the bus was making its way up the mountain. The rain had stopped and wavy plumes of steam drip drifted up off the asphalt. The narrow road curved back and forth and round and round. Now, every now and then, the bus stopped to let some kids off at a pitiful looking house with a dirt with a red dirt yard. We were almost to Gus and Bertha's when the bus stopped and Howard said, see ya. Another younger looking redheaded boy got off, off with him. I watched them make their way across the weed filled yard to their house. Bikes and skateboards and footballs and sneakers were scattered from the front door to the road. A garden hose snaked from a dripping faucet to a hole in the yard. A, a small, dirty-faced boy was dropping rocks into the hole, sending, sending up splashes of muddy water. Howard waved as the bus pulled away, but I turned my eyes back to that dried-up gum. When we finally got to Gus and Bertha's long gravel driveway, I got off and watched the bus drive away, making the rain-soaked Queen Anne's lace bob at the edge of the, of the road. I was starting up the driveway when I noticed something shiny in the dirt at the edge of the road. <gasps> A penny! I darted over and picked it up. Then I hurled it as far as I could and made my wish quick before that penny hit the road and bounced into the woods. There, I'd gotten in my wish for the day. Maybe this time it would finally come true. Chapter 2 I trudged up the long driveway, jumping over puddles of muddy rainwater and wondering what Jackie was doing right that very minute probably smoking cigarettes with some boy in the parking lot of the Piggly Wiggly across from the high school. Everybody thinks my sister is an angel straight down from heaven, but I know better. When Gus and Bertha's house finally came into view, I stopped. I'd been there four days already, but I still couldn't get over that house, hung off the side of the mountain like it did. The front of the house sma sat smack on the ground with flower shrubs nestled right up against it but the back was on stilts, stuck in the steep mountainside. On top of the stilts was a tiny porch with two rocking chairs and window boxes full of flowers perched on the railing. On my first night in Colby, Gus had dragged the kitchen chair out there for me after supper. Bertha had asked me about a million questions, like what was my favorite subject in school, and did I have a lucky number? Did I want to go swimming at the Y sometime, and did I like boiled peanuts? but I just mumbled and shrugged till she st finally stopped. I was too mad to talk. What was I doing there on that porch with these people I didn't even know? I felt like I'd been tossed out on the side of the road like a sack of unwanted kittens. So the three of us sat in silence, watching the sun sink behind the mountain and the lightning bugs twinkle off and on among the pine trees. I'd spent the next three days trying to convince Gus and Bertha that it was dumb for me to go to school since it was almost summer. But the next thing I knew, I was sitting on that bus full of hillbilly kids on my way to school. Hey there, Bertha called from the front door as I made my way across the yard. A fat orange cat darted out from behind the garden shed and trotted along beside me. Gus and Bertha had a whole passel of cats sleeping under the porch, sunning in, on the windowsills, swatting bees out in the garden. I went inside and dropped my backpack on Gus's tattered easy chair. The smell of warm cinnamon drifted through the kitchen door. I made coffee cake, Bertha said. I, wondered, I wonder why they call it coffee cake. Not a drop of coffee in it. She held the door open for the cat to come in. Oh, I know. I bet because you're supposed to drink it with coffee when you eat it. You think? Well, anyway, who cares, right? It had been clear to me from day one that Bertha was a talker, not like her sister, my mama, who went for days without saying a word. 
I had been surprised when I saw how much they looked alike, though. Same mousy brown hair, same long, thin fingers, even the same crinkly lines along the sides of their mouths. I sat at the kitchen table and watched Bertha cut a thick slice of coffee cake and put it on a paper towel in front of me. Then she pulled her chair close to mine and said, Tell me every little thing about your first day, your teacher, the other kids, what your classroom looks like, what you had for lunch, what you, what you did at recess, every little thing. Same girl, some girl ate a squirrel sandwich, I said. Bertha's eyebrow shot up. A squirrel sandwich? Are you sure? I licked my finger and pressed it on the paper towel to get coffee crumb cake, coffee cake crumbs. I nodded, but I didn't look at her when I said, I'm sure. A small gray cat sat on the kitchen counter, grooming himself. I wondered if that was the one Howard had given them. Bertha picked him up and kissed the top of his head. Charlie, Charlie don't want cat hair in her coffee cake, Walter. Then she gently put him down on the linoleum floor. His tail twitched as he watched a line of tiny ants marching from under the sink to a dark spot of something sticky on the, by the stove. And there's an up-down boy in my class, I said. Bertha cocked her head. What in the name of sweet Bessie McGee is an up-down boy? She snapped a brown leaf off a plant on the windowsill and tucked it into her pocket. This boy named Howard who walks up and down like this. I walked like Howard around the kitchen table. Howard Odom, Bertha said. Bless his heart. Good as gold that boy is. Don't bat an eye when kids poke fun at him, calling him names like Pogo. She shook her head. I swear, kids can be so mean sometimes. Pogo? Yeah, you know, like a pogo stick. He ought to punch their lights out, I said. That's what I do. Bertha opened her eyes at me, then shook her head. Not that boy. He couldn't hurt a fly. All them Odoms are like that. Good-hearted. Kind of wild sometimes, those brothers of his, but good-hearted. She brushed crumbs off the table and tossed them into the sink. Shoot. Just last week, three of those boys were over here helping Gus replace them boards on the porch that got eat up with termites, and they wouldn't take one penny. We sent them home with a burlap bag full of turnips, and they were happy as clams. Turnips? Any kids who were happy about a bag of turnips must be weird, if you ask me. Bertha sat at the table beside me again. So what else, she said. Tell me something else about school. I shrugged. I wasn't going to tell her about that getting-to-know-you paper dropped onto Miss Willoughby's desk like a hot potato or about how Howard being my backpack buddy. So I just said, nothing. Nothing? Nope. Bertha slapped her hand on the kitchen table. I almost forgot. She said, I got you something. She motioned for me to follow her down the hall to the tiny spare room where I'd been sleeping. Ta-da! She flung her arm out and grinned. I followed her gaze to the narrow bed in the corner. Propped up against the wall were two pillows in pink pillowcases with Cinderella on them. I realized this morning that this room don't look one bit like a girl, little girl's room, Bertha said. So I went down to Big Lots and got those pillowcases. I was going to get the matching bedspread, but it was a double and not a twin. I might go back and get this fluffy pink rug they now they have if I could can get Gus to help me move that bureau. I know, I need to get my canning jars out of here. And that old TV don't even work anymore, but she rambled on and on and I didn't even listen. Cinderella pillowcases? She must think I'm five instead of almost 11. She sure didn't know much about kids. That afternoon, Jackie called from Raleigh. She told me how Carol Lee's cousin came to visit and gave her a cashmere sweater she didn't want anymore. And Carol Lee's daddy was teaching her how to drive since Scrappy never would. She said she was thinking about putting blue streaks in her hair and that some boy named Arlo was taking her to a NASCAR race down in Charlotte. She was busy telling me about her life, her happy life, that she didn't even ask me what it was like what it was like living in Colby with hillbilly kids who eat squirrel. After we hung up, I went back to my room and laid on the Cinderella pillows and felt sorry for myself. How could Jackie be so happy? It seemed like she didn't care one little bit about me anymore. I bet Scrappy didn't care about me anymore either. I bet he was so busy playing basketball behind the tall fence at the county jail that he didn't even think about me up here on this mountain in a house full of cats with these people I didn't even know. 
and I knew for sure my mama wasn't thinking about me as she shoveled around the house in her bathrobe, all red-eyed and stoop-shouldered. I was definitely going to have to go out on that porch tonight and wait for the first star to come out so I could make a, my wish again. Maybe two in one day would do the trick. Chapter 3 That night, out on the porch with Gus and Bertha, I saw the first star twinkling over the treetops. I closed my eyes and wished like crazy. Making a wish, Gus asked. I felt myself blush. No, Bertha nudged Gus. Tell her about the time you wished your Uncle Dean would disappear, and then he did, she said. Gus flapped his hand at her. Oh, now, Bertie, you don't want to hear that boring old story. He rocked his chair, making the porch floor creak and groan. While Bertha talked a blue streak and hardly ever sat still, Gus was quiet and easygoing with a calm, slow way about him. He wore a baseball cap all day and half the night, his scraggly brown hair poking out from under it every which way. The bill of his cap was dark brown with dirt and greasy fingerprints. That there is Pegasus, he said, pointing to a cluster of stars hovering way up over the top of the mountains in the distance. Gus should have been a scientist, Bertha said. He can tell you everything you always wanted to know about stars and air and plants and water and weather and all that stuff. Gus let out a little pfft. He thinks I married him for his looks, Bertha winked. But I married him for his brains, she said. Gus laughed, and then the most amazing thing happened. They both reached out at the exact same time and held hands. It was like somebody had said, okay, on the count of three, hold hands. I'd never in my whole life seen Scrappy and Mama hold hands. Shoot, most of the time, they didn't even look at each other. I watched Gus and Bertha sitting there gazing at the night skies. The corner of their mouths turned up into contented smiles. Every now and then, Bertha looked dreamily over at Gus like he was a movie star and not some scraggly-haired man who worked in a mattress factory over in Cooperville. We stayed out there till it started to sprinkle again, a soft, cold rain that sent the cats at our feet, darting inside. I went to bed that night with my head swirling. I thought about Scrappy snoring away in the county jail and Mama staring up at the ceiling of her dark bedroom. I thought about Jackie whispering gossip and painting her toenails with Carol Lee. I thought about Howard Odom with his up-down walk and his good-hearted family. And I thought about Gus and Bertha, holding hands under the glow of Pegasus. And then I thought about my own pitiful self, laying there, wondering if my wish would ever come true. The next day, I wore Jackie's white, old white marionette boots to school. I knew I'd made a mistake the minute I got on the bus. As I made my way down the aisle, some of those girls pointed at my boots, giggling and whispering. I felt my face burn, and I glared at them. Howard motioned for me to sit next to him, but I flopped down in the seat behind him. I spent the morning drawing on my arm with a blue marker and pretending to read. At recess, Howard tried and tried to get me to get me to let him show me around the school. I'm your backpack, buddy, remember, he said. I shook my head. Forget it, I said. I'm not really interested. Besides, I'm not going to be here much longer. Why not? I rolled my eyes. I told you, I'm going back to Raleigh. But what if your mama don't get on her get her feet on the ground, he said. Well, what the heck kind of question was that? I stomped away from him and plopped down under the cafeteria windows and glared at the kids playing soccer on the playground. Once or twice I glanced over at Howard. He was drawing circles in the dirt with his foot, looking all mopey. When the bell rang, everybody scrambled to line up. A bunch of wild boys pushed and shoved their way in front of Howard, and he didn't even say anything. As I headed toward the line, a girl from my class named Audrey Mitchell waltzed right up to me and said, Nice boots. She smirked while her friends giggled behind her. I felt Scrappy's temper working its way from the, from the tip of my toes to the top of my head, hot as fire. Then I said, Thanks. They're good for kicking, and I kicked her skin and I kicked her skinny shin hard. The next few minutes were a blur of crying and hollering and tattling, and then I found myself sitting in front of Mr. Mason, the principal. While he lectured about my inappropriate behavior, I studied the inky little stars and hearts I had drawn on my arm that morning. Mr. Mason asked me if I knew that what I did was wrong and I and would I like it if somebody did that to me, and a bunch of other questions I didn't even care about. 
I said, yes, sir, and no, sir, and I kept my eyes on my inky arm and clunked the heels of my majorette boots against the legs of the chair. I shrugged when he said he was going to have to call Bertha and tell her what I'd done. Then I went back to my class and said I was sorry to Audrey Mitchell, even though I wasn't really. And that was how my second day of school in Kobe went. That afternoon on the bus, Howard ignored my laser thoughts again and began made a beeline right for me. He dropped into the seat next to me. You should have you should save me a seat, cause I think backpack buddies are supposed to sit together, he said. That's against the rules, I said. I'm pretty sure you can ha save a seat for a backpack buddy. I rolled my eyes and looked out the window. Why'd you kick Audrey Mitchell? Howard asked. I told him about I told him how she had not, she had said nice boots with that smirk on her face. He shook his head and said, Dang, Charlie, why you gotta get so mad about that? That ain't nothing. I shot him a glare. Maybe it was nothing to him, but it was something to me. I almost told him about my fiery temper that I got from Scrappy, but I didn't. Instead, I told him how I got sent home from kindergarten the very first day for poking some boy with a pencil. Eraser end or pointy end, Howard asked. Pointy. Dang, Charlie. I shrugged. I know, but I was mad. About what? He stuck his thumb right through my sandwich, I said. Howard shook his head again, making his red hair flop down over his glasses. Here's what you do from now on, he said. Every time you feel yourself starting to get mad, say pineapple. Pineapple? Yeah. Why? That'll be like a code word to remind yourself to simmer down. Mama taught my little brother Cotton to say rutabaga every time he gets the urge to draw on the wall. Does it work? Sometimes. That sounded like the dumbest thing I'd ever heard. But I didn't say so. We sat in silence as the bus made its way up the narrow mountain road. Every once in a while, the view at the, out the window changed from woods thick with pine trees and ferns and moss-covered rocks to a wide open view of the mountains stretching on forever in the distance. A smoky haze covered over them, soft gray against the deep blue of the mountains. That's why they're called the Blue Ridge Mountains, Gus had told me the first day I got to Colby, because they're blue. Then he had gone on to explain how the color was because of something the pine trees released into the air. I didn't know what the heck he was talking about, but I had nodded like I did. When the bus got to Howard's house, he grabbed his backpack and said, Remember, pineapple. I watched him and his brother go up the driveway, up the rickety steps of their front porch and disappear inside the house, letting the screen door slam with a bang behind him. Next to the front door was a ratty-looking couch covered with a bedspread. Wilted yellow plants and dried-up flowers planted in coffee cans lined the edges of the porch. Maybe the Odom's hearts were so good that they didn't care that they lived in such a sad-looking house. The bus chugged and groaned up the winding road. I was thinking about what I was going to say to Bertha about my kicking incident when a commotion outside the window caught my eye. Two dogs were fighting in a driveway, dirt driveway beside a cluster of trailers. One was small and black. The other one was brown and black and skinny as all get out. A little girl was screaming and carrying on while an old man turned on a garden hose and aimed a hard spray of water at the skinny dog. Get out of here, he hollered. A woman ran out of one of the trailers and tried to grab the black dog while the skinny dog snapped and growled and then suddenly just took off running. He ran along the edge of the road beside the bus for a minute or two, his long ears flapping in the breeze. I pressed my face against the window and watched him lop along the side of the road and then turn and disappear into the woods. When I got off the bus at Gus and Bertha's a few minutes later, I looked down at those majorette boots. Jackie had always looked so pretty in them, but I looked dumb. Those girls were right to laugh at me. That familiar, mad feeling was settling over me like a blanket. But this time I was feeling mad at myself for being a loser that nobody wanted. I stomped my foot and then I kicked at gravel, sending it tumbling into the rhododendron bushes along the side of the driveway. Then I whispered, pineapple, before heading up, on up to Gus and Bertha's. Chapter 4. I figured Bertha was going to be mad at me for kicking that girl, but she surprised me by putting my arm, but by putting her arm around me and saying, tomorrow's a new day. Then she gave me a little squeeze and added, personally, I love those boots. 
She didn't say one word about my inappropriate behavior. Mama would have hollered at me and reminded me for the umpteenth time that I was a troublemaker like Scrappy. After supper that day, we had blueberry pie for dessert, and I got to make my wish. If you cut off the pointed end of a slice of pie and save it for last, you can make a wish when you eat it. I learned that from a cousin of Melvin, from my cousin Melvin, who swore it had worked for him when his brother ran off and got married and left him with the bedroom all to himself. I knew Gus and Bertha were watching me cut off that pointed piece and push it to the edge of my plate. But they didn't say anything. Even Bertha had been kind of quiet during supper. Maybe she really was mad at me for kicking Audrey. Maybe she was thinking, that apple don't fall from, far from the tree. Maybe that night in bed, she and Gus would whisper to each other how much I am like Scrappy. And what in the world had they gotten themselves into when they agreed to let me stay with them? After I ate that little pointed piece of pie and made my wish, I went out front to watch Gus do some weeding in the vegetable garden. A fluffy black cat rubbed against my legs, purring up a storm. I wrote my name in the dirt with a stick and then scribbled it out. There wasn't one blade of grass in that yard, just dirt and rocks with sprinkles of color here and there. Patches of wildflowers nestled around the clothesline posts. The pink blooms of a dogwood tree over by the driveway. A neat row of daffodils lined up like soldiers along the edge of the chicken wire fence that surrounded the garden. Gus whistled while he hoed around the tiny tomato plants, stepping carefully between the pole beans and zucchini that were just beginning to poke through the warm spring dirt. On my very first day in Colby, Bertha had said to Gus, let's take Charlie on a tour of the garden. So I had followed along behind them while they pointed at each little plant, telling me how the pole bean was, were going to climb up the twine and the zucchinis would have giant yellow flowers. I had nodded and said, oh, because what else can you say about vegetables in a garden? But Gus, you would have thought that that was the Garden of Eden out there and the way he took care of it, examining each new leaf on the okra plants or moving a squash vine off of the walking path. So while I scribbled in the red dirt, Gus whistled and hoed. Every now and then, he tugged on the bill of his cap and swatted at mosquitoes. I could hear Bertha in the kitchen talking to some of the cats while she fed them, scolding one of them for killing a bird, telling another he was getting too fat. I was about to go on back inside when something caught my eye. There was movement behind the tangle of shrubs that separated the yard from the woods. The black cat darted off, disappearing behind that shed over by the garden, and I stood real still and squatted in, squinted into the, into the darkness of the woods. All of a sudden, a dog poked its head out from behind the bushes, a skinny brown and black dog with long floppy ears, the same dog I had seen fighting that afternoon. He looked at me, cocked his head, I took one slow, tiptoeing step toward him. He ducked his head back a little, watching me. I took another step, and quick as lightning, he ran off into the woods. Dang it, I said. You saying something, Gus called from the garden? There was a dog over there. I pointed to the bushes. Brown and black, floppy ears? Yeah, I said. Did you see him? No, but I've, been, I've seen him plenty of times before. Who does he belong to? Gus propped the hoe against the fence and sat in a lawn chair in the yard. Just an old wild stray, he said. Been hanging around here for months. Bertha keeps putting, ta putting table scraps out for him. He don't mind eating her meatloaf, but he don't want anything, nothing else to do with her. I looked towards the woods. I bet I can catch him, I said. Gus took off his baseball cap and scratched his head. That old mutt is mighty skittish. If I can catch him, can I keep him? I think that dog would rather be a stray, he said. But I knew better. I knew what it felt like to be a stray, not having a home where nobody wanted you. And he was like me, a fighter. That dog and I had a lot in common. I was suddenly overwhelmed with love for that skinny dog. I made a solemn vow and promise to myself right then and there. That dog was going to be mine. Chapter 5 I thought I was glad when the weekend came because I didn't have to go to school. But then Bertha told me we were going to church on Sunday. I hadn't been to church since I was little. Scrappy never wanted any part of it, calling those people do-gooders and Bible thumpers. But Mama took me and Jackie for a while. I didn't remember much 
about it, except Jackie's whining and complaining on the way there until Mama slapped her legs and told her to hush up. But then Mama got too nervous to drive and wouldn't take off her bathrobe or even comb her hair, so we stopped going. When I walked into Bertha's kitchen on Sunday morning, she looked me up and down and said, Oh, dear. She wiped her hands on her apron. Do you have a dress? I looked down at my jeans that were too short and my t-shirt that used to be Jackie's and shook my head. Bertha flapped her hand at me. Well, that's okay. We'll, we'll go shopping this week. Then Gus came in the kitchen, and I didn't hardly even recognize him. He had on a coat and tie instead of his usually mu usual muddy boots. He wore lace-up black shoes, buffed and shined. He could have passed for one of those fancy rich bankers over in Raleigh, except for the garden dirt under his fingernails, and his hair squashed flat from his baseball cap. He sat at the kitchen table, and Bertha kissed his cheek. Well, look at you, she said, making him blush and swat her hand off of his shoulder. He kept pulling at his collar and, and wiping sweat off the back of his neck. After breakfast, we headed down the mountain to Rocky Creek Baptist Church. When I got inside, I knew right away why Bertha had said, Oh, dear, when she saw me that morning. The other girls in church wore dresses. I couldn't look anybody in the eye, knowing my face was beet red and my jeans were all wrong. I sat on the hard wooden pew, sandwiched between Gus and Bertha. While the organist played church music, more and more people filed in, smiling and nodding at one another. Then Bertha poked to me and whispered, There's the Odoms. I glanced up to see Howard and his family carrying their Bibles and making their way to the pews to the pew across the aisle. Five boys with slick down hair, poking each other and clomping too loud in their Sunday shoes. Their mama chatted with folks, asking about their sick grandmas and making on over their babies, while their red-headed daddy mopped his face with a handkerchief. After a prayer and a hymn, the kids had to go to their Sunday school class. Imagine my surprise when I got to, to my class and there was Audrey Mitchell. She looked at me all wide-eyed, like I was a Martian right off of a spaceship. I sat as far away from her as I could, and then Howard came in with his up-down walk and sat next to me. Our Sunday school teacher was a gray-haired, wrinkly-faced woman named Mrs. Mackey. She didn't waste one minute telling everybody that my name was Charlie Reese, and please welcome me to their church family. Then she taught us a song called Good Old Noah. Howard sang louder than anybody, and personally, thought it was a little embarrassing that nobody else seemed to pay him any mind. After that, Mrs. Mackey told us we were going to play a game called Bible Detective. She would read questions from her Bible detective cards, and whenever you answered one right, you got a Bible buck. When you got enough Bible bucks, you could cash them in for a prize. While she read the questions, the boys fidgeted and the girls whispered and giggled in their dresses while I kept quiet in my ugly jeans. How many braids were in Samson's hair? Name the man who went down into a pit on a snowy day to kill a lion. In what book, chapter, and verse can we read about a, about a winner of a beauty contest becoming a queen? Howard's hand shot up every time, but I knew for sure I was never going to win any Bible bucks. After school Sunday, all the grown-ups and kids gathered in the fellowship hall. Bertha paraded me around like I was a beauty queen, introducing me to everybody and making, making on over me and saying how lucky she and Gus were to have me staying with them. People nodded and said, ain't that nice, and stuff like that, but I bet they were wondering why my own mom and daddy couldn't take care of me, and I didn't know girls don't wear jeans to church. When Bertha introduced me to Howard's mama, she hugged me and said Howard had told me about, told her about me. Then she craned her neck, looked around the room. Mr. Odom must be outside, and I'll never catch those wild boys of mine long enough to introduce you. Some of the Odom boys chased each other around the room, their ties loose and their shirt tails flapping. They grabbed brownies off the off the paper plates while Howard showed everybody his Bible bucks. Bet you come on by the. But you come on by the house any time, okay? Mrs. Odom said. Bertha grinned at me. Now, wouldn't that be nice, Charlie? I nodded and said, yes, ma'am, because I knew that's what I was supposed to say. When we fl finally climbed into the car and headed up the mountain toward home, I scanned the woods and yards along the way, hoping I'd see that stray dog again. But I didn't. What I did see, though, was a truck full of hay, 
Jackie's friend Casey told me if you count to 13 when you see a truck full of hay, you can make a wish. So, of course, that's exactly what I did. Things at school seemed to get worse every day. My homework papers came back all marked up by Mrs. Willoughby in a red pencil with notes like, See me and try again. Sometimes I didn't even do my homework. It seemed like a waste of time. I wasn't going to be there much longer. Once in a while, Bertha asked me if I had some homework, and I was pretty good at just shrugging and changing the subject. Besides, I was used to getting marked up papers like that, because back in Raleigh, I wasn't exactly student of the year. Jackie was the one who was the only one who ever fussed at me for not doing going to school or not doing my homework. But I reminded her that she was not my mother, so she could leave me alone. When the teacher called the house to tell Mama how bad I'd done on my math test or asked why I hadn't turned in my book report, Mama would holler and carry on for about five minutes. And then she'd throw up her skinny arms and heave a big sigh before she said, What's the use? Then she'd shuffle out of the room in her bedroom slippers, muttering about how she didn't deserve that aggravation. At least in Raleigh, I had friends at school, but here, when I sat at a table in the cafeteria, girls made faces like they smelled something bad and slid their trays away from me. Most days, I pretended like I had a stomach ache and spent the afternoon in the nurse's office drawing more stars and hearts on my arm with a marker. At recess, Howard followed me around, reminding me he was my backpack buddy and asking questions a mile a minute. Did you ever visit your daddy in jail? Why aren't your sister why ain't your sister here too? You want some of my Bible bucks? Sometimes I answered him and sometimes I didn't. The thing about Howard was everything just rolled off of him. It seemed like nothing bothered him one little bit. He was clear that nobody at school wanted much to do with him, but he didn't seem to mind. His brother, Dwight, was always surrounded by cussing, punching, ball tossing, fist bumping boys, but Howard Howard never joined them. A couple of times when I rode into town with Gus and Bertha, I'd see his older brothers, Burl and Lenny, tossing a football or shooting hoops with their friends. But Howard would be sitting on the steps, scribbling in a notebook, or over by the garage, fiddling with his bicycle. Bertha had commented about him one day when we drove by. That poor boy is too much of a loner, she said. Nothing wrong with that, Gus said. Bertha shook her head. Not for a child. Children need friends, Bertha sighed. I don't get it. He's just as sweet as can be. I bet it's because of his up-down walk, I said. Well, that's mean, she said. She turned around to face me. You're going to make so many new friends here in Colby. Charlie, I just know it. I stared out the window and pretended like I wasn't even listening to her go on about all the things I could do, like Girl Scouts and 4-H. She told me about her friend Janelle, who lived in Fairview and had a daughter my age. We would visit them some Saturday if I wanted to, or maybe we could go to the mall down in Asheville. On and on she went, talking as if my life in Colby was going to be like living in Disney World. You're going to talk that girl's head plumb off, Bertie, Gus said. Bertha laughed and slapped him playfully on the arm. Where do you think that dog is, I asked Gus. Could be anywhere, he said. That muck gets around. I'd been looking everywhere for that stray dog. I'd seen him twice since that day he'd come to Gus and Bertha's, but both times he darted off into the woods when he saw me. He sure loves my meatloaf. I can tell you that, Bertha said. He licks that pan clean and then hightails it out of here. There, so fast, I hardly get so much as a glimpse of him. I leaned back against the seat and sighed. I bet I was never going to catch that dog. And what if I did? Could I really keep him? Mama would probably have a hissy fit, but I bet Scrappy would call from jail and tell her to stop her yammering and let me have a dog if I wanted one. Then, as we were turning onto the old main road into, into town, I saw a black horse out in the field eating grass and swishing its tail at flies. I shook my fist at it three times and made my wish. That was the rule for black horse wishing. If you see a white horse, just make a wish. But for a black horse, you have to shake your fist at it three times. I'd learned that one from Scrappy, which made me a little skeptical, but I did it anyway. Shook my fist and made my wish. And we're going to stop right there and until we see each other again. Have a great day.